Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is episode 13, and in this one we're gonna cover a session from a casino many of you might have heard of, Ocean's Eleven, just a few miles north of San Diego, California. Decided to keep it relatively low stakes today. $2, $2, no limit hold'em. Still a good game. We're in for 200, so 100 big blinds is good. Let's see what we can do. In the first hand, there's two limpers, and we look down at ace, deuce of hearts from middle position. I decided to raise it up to $14. The button makes the call, and one of the limpers makes the call. So we're stuck in between these two players going to the flop, which comes king 5 4 with two hearts. Actually, gives us a draw to a straight flush. The limper checks. I decided to check. The button only has around $100 left, so I think if he puts in a bet, it's a good spot to go for the check jam. That's what I decide to do. I check and the button indeed puts out a bet. He makes it $20 to go. The limper folds and I don't think I wanna call out of position with just ace high on a board like this. So I decide to maximize fold equity. Plus we have pretty good equity if called. I put it all in. I think his remaining stack at this point was 70 or 80 bucks right around there. He goes in the tank and eventually lets it go. So. Who knows, we could have had a straight flush right off the bat here at Ocean's 11. Still happy to take the pot. In the next hand, the under the gun player opens to $12 and we look down at pocket eights in middle position. I decide to put in the call, the button makes the call and the small blind makes the call as well. So we're going four ways to a flop which is interesting to say the least. It comes nine, eight, seven, all hearts. So we flop middle set here on a super wet coordinated board. It's definitely not the strongest of sets. The small blind checks and now the under the gun player who was the initial aggressor goes all in for his remaining $60. Action's back on us. And I think I need to put in a raise here for protection. If I call the button and small blind get a fairly good price to call with a ton of draws that are available on this board. I don't think I need to go too big here though. So I make it 140. Doesn't really matter because the button and small blind both make the fold. So we're heads up, all in, going to the turn and river. Turn's not the best, it's a 10. So we now lose to pocket 10s and pocket jacks, which are likely holding in this scenario. The river's a five. I just show my hand right away and he shows pocket queens, which was one of the over pairs that we still beat even on this pretty nasty board. Moving on to the next hand with a healthier stack. In the next hand, early position opens to $10 and we look down at king nine of diamonds directly on his left. I could certainly entertain a fold here, but we're both fairly deep, so I think it's also fine to just make the call and play post flop. That's what I decide to do and the small blind calls as well. The flop comes ace four five with two diamonds. So we flop the nut flush draw. The small blind checks, middle position continues for $20. Nothing to do here but call, I think, so that's what I decide to do. And the small blind calls as well. So we're still three ways to a turn here, which is an offsuit nine. Now we have the nut flush draw and second pair. The small blind checks, and this time the early position player decides to slow down, puts in the check. Action's on us, and I think you could consider a bet here, but I almost think it's over repping our hands slightly, and with pretty decent showdown value and decent equity. I don't think it's necessary to bloat the pot here and I'm not sure what can call us that's worse aside from maybe just a naked flush draw. I decided to check and evaluate the river which is an offsuit seven. This time the small blind leads out for $55 and the early position player thinks for a bit and folds. So I'm not sure what we beat here aside from a bluff and this player type in particular had not gotten two out of line as long as I've been there. And I just don't see this player type in particular bluffing into two opponents. I decided to make the lay down. We don't get to see what he had. So hopefully it was the right play. In the next hand, there's an under the gun limp and we look down at pocket nines from early position. 
I decided to make it $12 to go. The button makes the call and when it folds back to the under the gun limper, he puts in the old limp re-raise. He makes it $42 to go, so 30 more. I looked out at my stack, I have around 400. The button has around 400. And the under the gun player has, I think like 100 behind. So considering the under the gun player only has 100, I think if it's heads up, it's just a fold because we're not getting the right implied odds to set mine. But with the button behind me, it's an interesting spot. If I call and he calls as well, we're still fairly deep and flopping a set could be a pretty sweet spot. So think about it for a minute and decide to make the call just because the button's behind me. Unfortunately, the button calls as well. So, so far everything is going according to plan. And that plan really comes to fruition when the flop comes nine, eight, six rainbow. Pretty sweet spot, obviously. The under the gun player open ships it, which I expected him to do on almost all flops. I think about it for a bit, put on a little bit of Hollywood, not too much, and make the call, just begging the button to call behind me. And he goes into the tank, which I think is a good sign because he could actually have a lot of sets here himself. Eights and sixes are hands that I would expect to play this way, and maybe even jacks or tens that play a little bit passive pre-flop. So I think we're about to get some good action, but unfortunately, he just lays it down. I immediately show my hand to the uh, under the gun player, and he shows us an over pair, which was expected. We hold and manage to collect a decent sized pot. In the next hand, the under the gun player opens to $4 with only $16 behind. Player next to Act puts in the call. He's fairly deep stacked, I think around 300. And we look down at Red Pocket Kings, my favorite hand in Texas Hold'em. I put in the three bet, make it $16 to go. The under the gun player ends up making the fold and the second player calls. So we're heads up going in position to this flop, which comes queen three deuce. He checks it over to us and I put in a C bet of $15. He thinks for a second and makes the call. Turns an interesting card, it's a king of clubs. He checks it over to us and given that I think this player has a middling pocket pair or a queen at best, I just don't see how I could get two streets of value here. So I decided to check and just get value on the river. I check and we go heads up to a river, which is an offsuit ace. Even worse card because now he can call almost nothing unless he has somehow a non-believing ace that floated the flop or ace queen, which seems extremely optimistic, but he checks it over to us. And as soon as I reach for chips, he just lets it go. So. I think it's actually an unfortunate run out. We turned top set and maybe got a little bit too much of the board that time. All right, you guys be the judge, but I think this next hand is the most interesting from this session. There's an early position open to $10, folds all the way around to us in the big blind, and we look down at seven five of spades. It's a good hand to defend, especially seeing as we're both around $400 effective. So I put in the call and we go heads up to a flop, which comes 10, eight, nine with one spade. So we flop an open ender here. I check it over to him and he puts in a C bet of $15. Not going anywhere just yet. I make the call and we see a four of spades turn. So now we have an open ender and a flush draw. Not only that, but I think this board heavily favors the big blinds defend range a lot more than an early position open range. So I check it over to him and he puts in a bet of $20. And I think this is actually a good spot to go for a check raise because he's just gonna have to fold so many hands here. Even an over pair is so difficult to continue with. And uh, unless he has like a flop straight or top set, there's just not a lot of hands he can call a check raise on a turn and a big bet on the river with. On top of that, we have equity and no showdown value. So I decided to take the high variance route this time, put in the check raise to $75. Unfortunately, this time he puts in the raise for all of his chips. <sighs> so pretty ugly spot. I'll be honest, I did not expect a re-raise all in here. I thought he had an over pair and it's just gonna be so hard to continue with an over pair given that on this kind of board, we could have a lot of two pairs, flop straights, sets. 
So I still like the play, but this time it doesn't work out. We're not getting the right price to continue, and I just decide to lay it down. On to the next hand. All right, this last hand is a bit of a head scratcher. Let's just go through it. Under the gun open the $8. We look down at queen 10 offsuit on the button, and I actually don't hate any of the three available options here. I think a fold is fine. It's not a great hand. I think a call is also fine, uh, being that we have position and it is somewhat playable. And a three bet is fine because it gives us a lot of different ways to win the pot. Right here, pre-flop and also on the flop, we can represent some stronger hands. So this time I decided to just call and the small blind calls as well. So we're going three ways to a flop, which comes 10, eight, six. Small blind checks and under the gun player checks. I think this is a good spot for us to bet because although I'm not expecting to get called by worse, often we're very vulnerable to over cards and I don't think it's a spot where I want to check back and let one peel so I make it $15 the small blind calls and the under the gun player calls as well so we're still three ways to a turn which is a nine of spades to my surprise the small blind leads out on this card for $35 and the under the gun player makes the call so I'm not too sure what's going on here. Uh, it's hard to believe we still have the best hand, but at the same time, it's also hard to think what hands would play this way that are ahead of us. You would think a check raise is in order with a lot of better hands than one pair here. So not too sure what's going on here. We might be facing a spaz from the small blind. The under the gun player calling again is somewhat concerning though this player was fairly sticky. So being that I'm not too sure what's going on and I still have top pair with a somewhat decent kicker. I don't hate a fold in this spot, but I decide to call and evaluate a river. Still three ways to a river here, which is the seven of spades, completing even more straights and bringing in the backdoor flush draw. This time the small blind checks and the under the gun player puts out a bet of $140. So under the gun is the aggressor pre-flop. We're the aggressor on the flop. The small blind is the aggressor on the turn and back to the end of the gun player for the river. What a weird hand. I'm not too sure what's going on here. I think we're actually facing a bluff from the end of the gun player, but with a small blind left to act behind me, he was an unorthodox player, and I'm not even sure if he's calling or folding. His line's not too strong, neither is under the guns, but I decided to just let it go. Uh, it's such a weird spot. The small blind ends up folding as well, so we don't get to see what the under the gun player had. I'm curious to see maybe what you guys think about that weird hand. All right, so that closed out the session for us and we end up booking a small win of $46 in a little under three hours. Could have been better, could have been worse. I think it's actually the first break even session of the vlog. So I'm glad to uh, reach that milestone at least. Before I go, I wanted to share some of my thoughts on Ocean's Eleven Casino, starting with the pros. Number one for me is gonna be the area. It is so beautiful down there in Oceanside. There's a lot to do, and just the surrounding neighborhood is extremely nice. Secondly, the inside of this casino is nice as well. It's well laid out, it's simple, it's just a big room with a bunch of poker tables, there's no frazz about it, and it's just a comfortable place to play. Another thing I noticed about this place, which I think is great, is that they offer a lot of stakes to play. So it makes it a lot easier to build a bankroll if this is your home casino. They have one two no limit, two two no limit, two three, two five. I think they have five five as well, uh, five ten and well above that. It's pretty cool to have all these options at one casino. Another thing I liked about this place was that they allow 100 big blind buy-ins for all their games. And in most of them you could buy in for even more. So. You guys know I'm a huge advocate for deep stack poker. Ocean's 11, got it right. Moving on to the downsides of this location. Number one for me is gonna be game selection and just overall game quality. This location is filled with a ton of regs. There's not a lot of recreational players here. And there's just a ton of pros and people who go there almost every day. As a result, the games aren't super easy or super fun for that matter and it's just hard to uh, grind out a decent hourly win rate in these types of rooms. 
The second point I'm going to make is somewhat tied to the first, and that is that the overall style of gameplay here is a tight, passive approach. Obviously, there's outliers to this, just like there are in any casino, but for the most part, the players here don't get out of line too often, and there just aren't a lot of big pots. I've been there a few times now, and every single time, I've noticed there's just not much action unless someone's holding the nuts or the second nuts. I could be wrong, but relative to other California casinos, this is not my favorite place if you're looking for action. The third thing I wanted to say is that the atmosphere itself just feels very serious and not super gambly and fun, which is my own personal preference. If you guys are into like a very focused and quiet poker room, I think this is the place for you, but myself and I think a lot of you guys out there just prefer a bunch of rec players and everyone having drinks and having fun and talking at the table. That's just not what you're gonna find at Ocean's Eleven for the most part. Overall, I'd say this is not a super fun place to play poker. I could be wrong. Obviously, this is just my opinion. You guys are welcome to try it out. Maybe you guys will like it, but personally, not a huge fan of this place. I'd give it a five out of 10. Hopefully you guys get a chance to play there. It's still a poker room worth checking out if you're in the area. Okay, so before I wrap up the vlog, I wanted to give a quick announcement. As many of you guys know, Seminole Casino is my main poker room, and unfortunately they're closing forever, April 30th. So I'll be spending the rest of my days there until they close. That's gonna be the next vlog, so stay tuned for that. If you guys have a chance, head over there and play a session before that's no longer possible. Anyway, as always, thank you guys for watching. Thanks for all the support. If you're enjoying the content so far, give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't. It helps the channel grow. That's it. I'll see you guys next video. Good luck out there at the tables. Peace.